Right guys, welcome back to Coaching Conversations with Pete and Yas. But before we get to today's episode, just a quick announcement from our partnership with St. Mary's University Twickenham. Yeah, so thanks for having me. Um, I'm Ashley, our performance football coaching course lead, uh, as you know, as a member of our alumni. Um, our course is unique around the world, so we believe that we have a, a, a distance learning model that kind of works for everyone, regardless of where they are in the world. They can study football performance coaching from their environment and put it into their context. Amazing. And who is it for? So we really have lots of different unique opportunities. So you can be a pro license coach that we've had in the past. You could be a level two UEFA B coach. It's about putting it into your context. So we'll expose students to match analysis, uh, contemporary football coaching cultures, and they can put that into their own practice and improve their knowledge and understanding of the game. Thank you for that, Ash. And as an alumni member of St. Mary's University Twick, and I'm proud to announce the partnership that we've got going on, where each week myself and Pete will be delivering conversations around different how-to elements and analysis tips and obviously some insights from our own experiences as coaches and coach developers. So catch that on YouTube and every week on all major platforms where you can hear it in audio form as well. Right guys, welcome back to Coaching Conversations with Pete and Yes. Last week we spoke about player care and what it is. Um, and this week we're going to build on that conversation with our special guest again, Mark Rivers. And um, we're going to be looking at retain versus release. But before we do that, Pete, just a brief insert around who you are, what you do. Yep, Peter Augustine and I am a coach developer and also a licensed coach. And Mark's first coach. <laughs> <laughs> I tried to say that I'm not old. <laughs> If the shoe fits. No, but um, I, I probably couldn't have been Mark's first coach, but I started coaching very, very young. I'll give you that. 14. Uh, well, don't show Mark's age. <laughs> right. uh, but Mark, no, over, over to you, obviously, you know, straight, straight off the back of the last conversation, you know, there were some really key insights around what player care meant, what it looked like, and obviously in your role um, in the pre-academy, what it could mean at that stage and age of the game. Obviously, Pete shared some insights around what it looked like at more of a senior level and maybe in the non-league uh, mm. aspect of things. But this whole process around retain and release, we spoke a little bit about it in the last conversation. Um, but just for those, again, that, that you know that aren't really in that world and really have an insight on what this what this actually means and what it looks like, and what, what's your perception of mm. this conversation around retain versus release? Mm. Yeah, it's an interesting one. And it's, I suppose, that side of um, um, academy football that can become difficult when um, coaches and workforces have to have those sometimes uncomfortable uh, discussions about retain and release. I think where we live in uh, in the pre-academy, it's a little bit different. So it's probably a bit more recruitment over development at that age. Um, so we're looking at boys coming in that are able to perform within the playing style. Um, but even so, as I'm, as I'm talking and thinking about it, you know, these boys are, are so, so young. No one's got a crystal ball. It's very difficult to be able to, you know, determine what they're going to look like come sort of 17, 18, 19. I'll defy anyone. I mean, um, it is so difficult. So you, you can only sort of go, go on w what you see in front of you at that particular moment in time um, and just hope that you get them in, um, you, you secure them from an early age. And for me, it's trying to give them the best chance to um, at least kind of sort of uh, navigate their way through the foundation phase um, and uh, hopefully beyond. And Pete, I'm just going to come, come over to you now. Obviously, we've all had experiences at different ages and stages and, and just levels in working in academy football as well. Um, Mark's obviously looking at it from a perspective of pre-academy. And I think something really important that he said is it's much more recruitment over development at that point. Um, and I'm sure we'll delve a little bit more into that. But from your perspective, your experiences in, in academy football, what are some of the observations that you're trying to make and what are some of the conversations that you're maybe having and how many people are really involved in that process? Because like there's going to be a lot of people listening to this right now that are probably thinking about embarking on that journey into academy football. Um, there'll be other people listening to this thinking, actually, I want my kids to be in, a, in academy football. So maybe get a bit of an understanding of that process. But even on the flip side of that, you've got maybe people working on the recruitment teams listening to this thinking, well, actually, how much of this am I maybe doing or am I, am I not doing? How much of this process that I'm involved in could be even better as a result of this conversation? Yeah, I think it, 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 you have to come at it from a, a number of angles. So obviously, what are the, what's the club looking for? What kind of players are they looking for? Um, and, you know, what's the process to get the players along the journey for, for that club to be seen as a 
maybe a first team player or an under 18 player or whatever it is. So it's understanding that that's really, really crucial. Secondly, the other thing is to think about is as the coach, how much coaching are you doing to help those players come along that on that journey? Now, the truth of the matter is the statistics tell us that only 90, uh, that only 1% make it. So when you think about that, you then have to think that the clubs must be looking for something very, very, very specific. However, I've uh, seen instances where some of the coaches that I've worked with in the past and some of the coaches that I um, uh, have mentored or whatever, they're not quite sure of what that 1% is. Mm. What, what is that thing that they're looking for? You know, so they'll, they'll say about a player, oh, um, oh, I just don't fancy him. You know, that dangerous. Mm. Because now you're starting to go on this thing where it's what I feel, uh, not what I see or what I've observed or, or the stats or whatever it is. Because sometimes the stats say one thing, mm. but the coach is feeling something else, you know? So we have to be really, really careful here, um, I, I think. I mean, obviously, I've, never, not, I've not been in that position where I've had the final say on who gets released. But I look at players when I've been in academies and I'm thinking, well, why are you here? Mm. What did the scout see in you to bring you in? Mm. You know, why is it we're not um, looking at that player there and seeing that player's got this potential and so on and so forth? And I see that and I think, wow. I, I think you know it's, it's a great point. I'm just thinking about some of the experience I've had and you know, some of the players come in and I'm thinking, whose bread have you buttered to get into this building? Because mm. you shouldn't be here. And then mm. on the flip side of that, it's that challenge of from the coach's perspective, you know, going back to what you said previously, Mark, around you know, blame the players last. I'm a, I'm a mm. fundamental believer in it. I think uh, as a coach, um, you've, re you've we've really got to just take accountability for everything. Even when, I, I, I say to coach all the time, even when it's not your fault, it's your fault. Mm. If you look at it through that lens, you're always mm. going to try and find a solution for the problem. Mm. right? And even if it is genuinely not your fault, mm. take it as your fault and then you mm. will get to a, cl get mm. to a point closer but then you know it sometimes makes you think well you know if the stats are 99% of players don't make it then are the coaches really having an impact and I'm not saying they're not yeah. because you know I also believe that you know obviously good coaching does help but the cream's always rising to the top mm. right and then I think you know beyond that uh, the, the question I've started asking a lot more coaches now is well, how do you know what you're doing is working mm. <laughs> how do you actually know what, is, mm. what you're doing is working because if you believe it's working guess mm. what it also didn't work mm. for ninety nine percent of the players that you mm. didn't go, that you did right, yeah. So I, I think I think you both make some really good points, and I think unless you've got a real clear golden thread that runs through mm. that team, I mean, I was very fortunate to spend some time with Tony Carr, who who was very instrumental at West Ham and bringing some players through. You know, and, and if you look on some of their merchandise and everything, it's, everything's about the West Ham Academy, mm. the West Ham way. Um, so there was a clear way of playing the playing style that kind of ran through and I think unless you've got that I remember working with a um, a coach at a club in I think League One at the time um, uh, and a, sort of a first team manager and speaking to him and saying come down to the foundation phase and come and have a look and he was just like do you really think and he said it respect respectfully do you think I'll still be in this position as first team manager mm. when that under nine comes <laughs> up or if they come up to first team mm. level. Whatever you think about that is 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 by the by. But, um, you know, if you think about that in its simplest form, uh, we're coaching them in one way here, whatever that looks like. Is the manager going to be the same mm. manager when they're ready to mm. break? And what's the playing style going to look mm. like? Um, the game is evolving all of the time. Mm. We see it here today with uh, a, a Premier League and, 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 a, and a league full of um, inverted wingers. Um, we have uh, a left-back who plays as a number 10 in the same game. In the same game. Like, Pete, yes, we play, I played as a right-back. I wasn't allowed to cross the halfway line. I don't know about... As a right-back, same, yeah, same. don't cross the halfway yeah, line. Yeah. You're not getting up and, and putting yeah. crosses in. And yeah. No, 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 the winger does that. You stay mm. here. We've got wide players that, uh, sorry, um, fullbacks that end up in number 10. Mm. We've got inverted wingers, right footers on the left, left footers on the right, who, incidentally, if you're playing in the top level, you better be sure to weigh in with goals. Mm. But that era of getting to the byline, crossing it in for mm. someone else to score, you need to weigh in with double figures. Mm -hmm. 
um, if you're a centre back, you, you know it's got to be front foot mm. reception to go and receive the ball, not waiting for that ball to come into the number nine and then adjust to stop them turning. Go and win it, so you're on the on the front foot. Formations that change within mm. the game. I mean, and I, and I think I think it's a great point, Mark. And I think you know, obviously, the game has changed in in many respects. Even in you know, in my short time in it, in comparison to Pete's. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but no, but I think the 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 do you, do you not think we're in um we're in danger in some respects? Then that there's so many changes taking place in such a short space of time that maybe you're not really being rationalised and justified well enough. That actually we're not really helping enough. Does, does that make sense? Yeah, but I think there's a, there's a, there's a piece here, and and Mark is is part of this piece. What he does. Um, in pre-academy is that the players are given such a rich variety of playing that when they get up to that level where they're in and around that 18s first team level that they actually they've experienced everything they may have experienced most pitch most positions on the pitch they've played different competitions sometimes they've played abroad yeah that, that diet that rich diet at the professional level means that the player actually can cope with anything and i think that's I think that's a that's that's a, a great thing about some of the stuff. Um so when the player gets released at times, if there is a clear way of playing and doing stuff, you should be able to go, actually, I noticed that when this player was away and we were this, they were they they they, they couldn't settle, they couldn't do this, they couldn't do that. And we noticed that on four trips that this player went away with. Now this player is about to get signed the contract. They're very, very good. However, if we go into Champions League or whatever it is, or into Europe, can we carry this player? Because, because I mean, Dennis Bergkamp, famously at didn't Arsenal, fly. Didn't, didn't fly. Mm. Yeah, but he was an exceptional talent. Mm. So you were able to you were able to put up with that. And then the club's got to think: Well, is this person an exceptional talent? So exceptional that we can deal with. Maybe not taking mm. him to away games or whatever it is. But we don't know that, as you mm. said, Mark. We mm. don't know that at eight. We don't know that at 15. What we know is what they're doing now. And because there's so many players in the system that you can go, okay, you can, you can go after, we'll, we'll take that player now. Mm. And even when you, if you think about it now, you look at, say, uh, and, uh, uh, somebody like Ivan Tony. Mm. Ivan Tony worked his way through the, the lower leagues and now he's playing in the Premier League. And now, look at the numbers that have been quoted for him. 100 million to sign Ivan Tony. Well, why didn't somebody spot that when he was 18, 19 or 16 or even 15? Mm, and I think, I think it's a great point. The one, you know, obviously as a coach developer, you know, people say to me, well, what is your role? And I, say, and I often say, look, I haven't got the answers for you. But what I can, do, what I can tell you is this. My role is to raise your considerations mm. around some of the things you're, you're currently looking at. Mm. It's raise your awareness around some of the things that you might have blind spots in. Mm. And I think it's the same for a coach to a player. It's helping the player to get to a point where they understand there's more to, to, to the journey. And there's more for them than they can currently see mm. themselves achieving. And part of that process is you as a coach being able to identify, right, where do we go next? Mm. What are the gaps? What are the things that we're not seeing? What mm. are the things that you've actually got as skills right mm. now, which maybe sometimes haven't even been valued and mm. appreciated yet because you might be a right back who can't go past the halfway mm. line. Or, you know, it, for a lot of young footballers who are maybe not in the right environments, and I use that loosely, but for a lot of young footballers, the mentality of, well, I'm, I'm a right back, so that means I'm a defender. Mm. Well, no, actually, your whole team is defenders when you're out mm. of the ball and vice versa when you've got mm. it. So, it's just about changing that perception of what that looks like for mm. the players and even then again managing the parents expectations within that and you know coming back to the the conversation around retain versus release it's always well how much have you done to help the player maintain the reason why they were here in the first place mm. right if they were brought in because they are someone who maybe doesn't go over the halfway line but actually they can ping a ball from there exactly where it needs to go and that's what they've been brought into well, how much time are you spending on enhancing that as a skill and maintaining that as a strength as well as rounding them off mm. with the other stuff rather than getting to a point where I don't know end of the season 
you're now releasing the player because they haven't necessarily developed the other capabilities that you're trying to work on to the standard that you want to see them at. But actually, you haven't done anything to build their strength at the same time. Yeah. <clears throat> I, I think, yeah, it's a really good point. I think the FA will talk about volume, variety, variation. Um, so I know I use that um, like map, if you like, of coming at a young age and what would the manager be like. But again, I think it would be remiss of us not to go, right, OK, let's do some stuff here on... Um, on um, 2v2s or 1v1s or 3v3s, 4v4s, let's see or expose them to um, mul multiple pressures. So how can we cope with pressure in front, pressure from the side, pressure from behind? What about fo football? You know, we can learn from um, Spain and other countries that they've had a great deal of success with futsal, um, you know, um, um, it, as a, as a right back, receiving the ball, I can think of it, uh, it now, the ball would come back to me and I'd punch it out with the inside of my foot. You watch the Premier League, it's <laughs> um, the bottom of the sole of your foot to roll the ball. I would still would not be comfortable doing that. Um, goalkeepers, the shapes that they pull, the big barriers, um, probably starting from Peter Schmeichels and Hambles and all of that kind of stuff. So I think we need to expose them to lots of um, different opportunities to try new things out. Um, and, you know, some of the stuff then you're looking at external maybe um, it, when it comes to that retaining release period, but yeah. we just need to do as much as we can. But just even just on, on that, and, and it's something that I'm quite big on, and, you know, yes, mm. we want them to experience a variety of different things. We want them to have that those rich experiences. Um, the only thing I challenge and maybe question sometimes is how well as as coaches we actually articulate this is what we're doing. So they have an awareness to say, okay, you need, it's not just through osmosis, you're gonna go through all these things. No, there needs to be a sense of awareness around it, right? There needs to be, an, you know, we're, we're doing this for this reason, or actually here's some of the things we're expecting to see, and here's why we're working on them, and actually almost somewhat connect, connecting the dots before they go over the, prop, the mm. track that we've created, if that makes sense. Yeah, I think, some of the younger ones, it's almost competence without comprehension, isn't it? Like I'm doing stuff. I remember one of our um, young players um, who's, who's well on his foundation phase journey now, um, almost in a game, waited for pressure from behind to move backwards, bounce the player out the way just to gain an extra yard or two. And I asked him after um, about, you know, why he did it. And he's like, did what? just didn't realize so did i then have to go and explain it it was it was without thinking without comprehension um i think later on it it, it would have it would have come in i mean we sit here today in the settings of a university and i think as you go through that process with 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 coaching you know we've got to do things in a in a logical order um so you know i see some coaches and us with our tutor hats on when you go out if I had a pound coin for every session I go to where the coach is saying, right, we're, we're playing out from the back tonight, then I wouldn't be sat here, guys. I'm sorry. I would, I, I would be in a yacht. I'd be, I'd be, <laughs> I'd be, on, I'd be on teams <laughs> on this call, but on the yacht. <laughs> if I could get Wi-Fi. Um, and that's no disrespect, by the way. That's no disrespect. I, I just think... Um, and it's contextual, right? So if that's what you think that we need to work on with our X age group, then that's great. I think the problem is sometimes when we watch Barcelona do rondos and then we bring that down to our under sixes, under sevens and ask them to do... And the university analogy is, <clears throat> um, again, it's ages and stages. I'm not going to teach a, a, an eight-year-old some academic stuff that I can see these university students doing because it's just not right in their yeah. development. I think it's a process that, that that we've got to go through and the time might be right. Mm -hmm. So for me, going back to retain and release, it's making sure at the early ages they can master the ball and deal with the ball. Mm. And later on, we can maybe look at when to share and keep in possession. And I think it's a great point to come back to what Pete said earlier, but you know, how many, how many coaches out there know what the 1% looks like? And the one thing I always say is this, you know, when you're planning, um, whether it's for your teams, whether it's for individuals or whatever it looks like, you need to know what's next. You need to know... Right, if this is what we're working on, so you take your analogy about the university thing, well, actually, it's, it's, it's maybe not as simple as I'm not going to do this with my, with my eight-year-old. Yeah. Actually, if I see some things that I know the eight-year-old can do, which actually are probably 
an 11 year old is expected to be able to do then i, I probably can stretch them a little bit further because mm. i know what's next mm. i know that they've already got if you like a, a, a one up on that journey so that i can now support them on what the next layer mm. is for that rather than purely just going on how old is this player no actually how well does this player perform what are the competencies of this player what are the capabilities of this player because that will then start to I guess give me a bit of an idea on okay well where on that journey if i know what the one percent looks like um and i know what if you're like an eight-year-old mm. look like in order to get to that one percent and then i also know the nine the ten the eleven mm. the twelve and i think there is an there is a there is mm. a there is value and there is merit in understanding the journey and not having to fix yourself to one age group specifically but it doesn't mean you have to specialize in every mm. age group you can still specialize in one but you need mm. to know what's coming in and what's coming out if that makes sense mm. but then again you, you conversely you can look at it in this way if if in your first team you've got 22 spots but in your academy you've got say 100 boys well just do the maths you know what i mean only 22 are going to make it if they come out of the academy so you've got to be thinking about from a point of view of well, how do I get my the, the, the more players to be going into that uh, into that first environment? Because not only is it um, uh, 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 how can I put it? It's cost effective, isn't it? Because now all of a sudden you're producing players for your first team who are good enough to go straight into the first team to play games. And then maybe even earn you as a club a profit. And I'm not only talking about this at the professional level, but it could also be at youth team levels, at um, League One, uh, League Two Championship, whatever it is. Because we see how many times you know um, Premier League clubs will nick a 14-year-old or 15-year-old and pay some compensation and so on and so forth. But I honestly, um, as a coach, I put my coaching hat on. I don't believe that there's is that you can not give a kid a really good experience at, uh, at, at playing football, but also helping them to improve along that, 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 that journey as well. And I think too often, we, and this is where we have to be careful as coaches, that our own biases don't blind some of the thoughts that we have. Now, I, I know for a fact there are sometimes I have blind spots. I know what those blind spots are around. And so I, I challenge myself all the time. Just take a step back from that and, then, and, 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 and have a look at what, you, what you're actually seeing here. And when you've got young kids in the academies, as a coach, you've got to step back and say, well, I don't like this player or I don't fancy this player, whatever phrase you're using. You go, okay, why? Can I be really specific about this? What are the things that are saying to me that this player isn't going to be able to go on from the under eight, say, for example, to the nines, to the tens and so on and so forth. And be really clear about that. And the EPPP can, can help with that because you've got to note stuff down and you've got to write, yeah, write yeah. reports. So, but, but you, you know, but as we all know, we can write stuff down. Mm. If nobody's watching us, we can write anything we want. Well, that's integrity comes into play, doesn't mm. it? I've got a question for both of you. Mm. And Pete, I've heard you say it a, a, a couple of times. Um, I'm just playing devil's advocate, really. But what what is making it? What is well, making uh, it to us? I had the exact same question as he said it. Like, what mm. is making? I think is it is it de is determining. I think what I think in the general context of this conversation, <coughs> making it will be securing a professional contract. But I think the um, I think the nuances that exist within that is well, what, what's the journey you took to get there? Mm. Right? Is it? You, you've progressed through 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, all the way up to 16. You've got yourself your first scholarship. Then, you, then the next thing you know, you've got your first pro at 18 or whatever that looks like. Or is it actually you've gone through the non-league route, you've gone through that route where you've had to, you know, you've played grassroots football at a reasonable level. You've gone, to, you know, played competitive football at non-league level and then all of a sudden you've been picked up. So I, I don't think there's a definitive. I think that, I think, that, but I think that's where I guess... I'm hoping that these types of conversations really start to spark some thought and ideas around well, what, what does that actually mean? What is our perception of that? What are the blind spots that we may have around that perception? Because fundamentally, it, you know, it, we delivered on a B license recently, right? And it come back to Pete's point as well. Part of their, their, you know, their course of learning is to get to a point where they can observe and, and, and assess their players effectively. And the, the question I always come back with is, well, you've got this player profile, 
you've given me an identification of what you think this player is able to do or can, cannot do or whatever, just like they would in academies with individual development plan and learning plans. But, but my question to the coaches are, well, prove it. You're saying this. Where's the evidence for that? Where where can you tell me that this player has actually been effective at, you know, playing out from the back if that's the way we're going to go with it? Because all of a sudden now you might say, well, actually... In the 10 games that you've identified, this player's been really good at playing out from the back. Well, I've never seen the opposition press him once. Mm. So is he still good at playing mm. out from the back? But but before we come to Pete, that example, you know, UA for B. Now, should everyone complete their projects, attend the blocks, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, attend the in-situ visits, then they'll get a signature from one of us three in the box that means they're deemed competent and they get a UA for B qualification. Some, as it's the highest grassroots award, will go and work in academies. Mm. Some will use that and, and go and better their, their, their grassroots teams. So they've got the same award, but one's there, one's up there somewhere wherever that, where, where that is. And that's my point with the players that come in the system. Mm. You know, is it them coming through... Um, being able to get out of comfort zones, being able to wrestle with and figure out problems and issues that at a later life they can, mm. I don't know, stand up in front of a group of people and present something mm. back, go and start their own business I mean, and I, still couple that with playing at a reasonable level. I, I think it's a, I think it's a great question and I think the, the, the thing to look at within it though is there's too many different variables which mm. can dictate that, right? Because... You know, whether we like it or not, whether we agree with it or not, coaches, clubs will have their way of working. They'll have their pathway that they want to set for players. Um, that will look different from a player that comes in at under eight as opposed to a player that might come in as an under 13. Um, you might even argue there's some cases where because the player has come in at under eight, even if the under 13 player has come in, by the time that under eight gets to under 13s, if the player's maybe just slightly below par compared to the player coming in, there's probably a little bit of loyalty to the under eight and say, well, mm. you know, we've had, We've got that connection with the player, so mm. therefore we're going to give them a bit more time. So there's, there might be, you know, might be some blind spots there. But then, equally looking at it from a perspective of what, what's important here, what, if we're going back to retain and release, well, what's the expectation? Well, well, I think it's really simple because I think it's it's like again, as what I said earlier, it's about focusing. What are you after? What are you actually after? Well, if you're in a professional club, you're looking for players to eventually play in your first team. If not playing your first team, then go and play football. That making making it as a footballer is about earning a living. Mm. Can you earn a living? Can you feed your family by playing football? Okay, that's making it. So, if you think and and in, and and go beyond that, not only can you are you making it from a point of view of I can earn a living because you can earn a living and not have a lot of money. Mm. But if I can earn a living, but at the end of that living, there's still money left over so that I can carry on living. So if you look at footballers now, the top ones, they earn so much money that really and truly, as long as they're capable of their money, reasonably capable, they don't have to work again. However, there are people who are working League One, League Two, they will still have to get another job after that, but they would still have made it because they've earned a living through football. But don't you think, you know, I'm, I'm not sure if you, I'm, I'm sure you guys have heard of similar, probably seen it in yourselves where actually that's not necessarily the case because some players are actually brought in because working with you two as part of my under 15 group, I'm banking on you two making it. Mm -hmm. The rest of these guys ain't here because of that reason. The rest of these guys are here because I know they're going to push you. Mm -hmm. like it, these types of things do happen. Yeah, yeah, they do. And we, and we know that they happen. However, the question was, you know, what's making it? Right, what's retain and release? Well, what's making it is, tell you what, I'm now signed my first professional contract. Next week, I'm with the first team squad. And I think it was one of the, one, I forget which one of the famous managers said, he says he doesn't call a player a pro until he's played at least 20 games or 100 games or whatever it was. Uh, it might have been Ferguson, I, I, I don't know, but, you know, but that's the truth of it. Because you could make it sign your first professional contract, but never ever play in your first, in your team's first time, teams you signed for first team, and you got along. I mean, I know a lad who, when I was um, um, uh, at Hampton, uh, got signed as a pro, and for us that was great because boy, he'd never been in the system before. He'd come through, and they signed a pro. Never played a first team game. Mm. 
was then loaned out to a to a non-league club and 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 this I think he's probably still playing non-league now. Very very good young player, but he signed for a League One League Two club. So is that but is that mismanagement of expectations then? Because you know because I think one of the you know if we're going back to this whole idea of retainer release, well does that player even understand the real reasons why they were brought in? Does that player also has that player given enough of an indication? And I, and I can certainly say this is not the case of many players in academies as well where all right first review if you like is what maybe October time a couple of months into the season as a coach how many times have you heard of a situation where actually this player is already on the on on the eyes of you know, on the list of yeah end of season he's out he's probably out you know he's in the second year mm -hmm. of a two-year agreement that we've made with them um how much of that is actually being transparent enough to you can understand that actually do you know what here's where you're at Pete this is what we need to see. And we're letting you know that off the bat. But you won't stay then, will you? you won't but, 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 then, then, but then it's me managing, it's, it's me setting that expectation, making it clear to you to understand that this is, this is what it's going to take. Yeah, but you're just not going to stay. If you, if you know, if, listen, if this about, say, for example, I go into a club and you're the star player and they say, we're bringing you in because we want you to push your ass. No, sorry, I think I'm a good player. I'm, I'm, I'm not staying here. Now, but what you might do if there's no other club giving you an opportunity to come in, and this is where the parents come into it as well, right? Because part of that, the whole process is, well, how many times have we experienced, and you probably experience it now, mm. where parents are just happy to say, yeah, my kid's at such and such club. Yeah, but that's, that's, no, that's no good for the kid. It's not, but then if we're coming back to the retainer release now, yeah, those but you, players may not be retained because their parents yeah, but you, have no expectations. But why are you going to join a club when you know you're going to get released at the end of the season? It's your parents' choice. Yeah, but it hasn't... It, it, it's at that age, uh, return and release age, the kids also have a say in that, right? I'm, I'm going into this club and I'm going to be released at the end of the year. Um, What's the point? No, but obviously, but that's, that's the point I'm making. Because the, don't forget, the, kid will have, the kid will have a sense of their own ability. The kid will have, uh, am I right in saying this, Mark? The kid is thinking, well, I, I'm actually a good player. Mm -hmm. Everybody told me for years <clears> I'm a good player. Now you're telling me I'm only good enough to, to, to work so that guy. You're a good player in the environment you've come from in comparison to this one that you're now stepping into. You actually might be near mm -hmm. the bottom of the group. So now what happens? Yeah, now it's a reality check, right? Yeah, look, I, I, I think it's, number one, it's contextual, um, given ages and stages, etc. Um, and also, I think, you know, these journeys are very, very, very much non-linear. Mm. Like, we just don't know. Mm. I suppose my example off the top of my head is, is my own son, who, you know, at, at 12 was released from an academy uh, for being too small. Mm. Um, so, um, no, no problems. Um, when you delve into it a little bit deeper and you look at, you know, early uh, and late maturation, when you look at birth quarters, I think we need to consider those kind of things as well. So he's a Q4. Um, most in his group were nine, ten months older than him. When you know at that time, psychologically, it's it can be massive. Yeah. Um, and um, you wind that on a couple of years later at 16, he's sort of six foot two. So um, it is a non-linear journey, and I think it would be, you know, I think it's probably poor practice to 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 you know, turn around and say, look, we're not going to offer you anything. You're just here to make the numbers up, essentially. Um, but certainly, yeah, it's, 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 I mean, look at us as coaches, you know, when we got into it, you never know that we're going to end up here and talking mm. nonsense on a <laughs> podcast. <laughs> <laughs> not that the podcast is nonsense. I'm talking nonsense. On no, no, this, this guy here, he's talking nonsense. No, I think I think I think, it's, I think it's a great point. I think um, I think most importantly for me, and I'm just thinking about this whole process. I think one of the key things that I'd say, if there's anything for coaches to consider in this process, is how transparent they're being with the players mm. and the parents and managing those expectations. Because I think, you know, I, I don't, I'm not saying that people are necessarily going out and no, 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 I know. Mm. But I think the, I think there is an element of that at times where it's it, it's a business at the end of the day. Mm. A lot of these clubs, and I've and I've seen it myself, where players are being signed just because the club might know that someone else is looking at the same yeah. player mm. and not because they believe that player is going to mm. necessarily make it. Mm. And then, you know, the, I think those are some of the considerations you have to make, right? Um, so that, those, are, those are some of the key things for me in, in particular in, in just understanding how, how well do you manage that expectation so that if it does come to a point where you're releasing this player, it's not come as a surprise. Mm. It's come as a thing where, look, we. it's not that the writing's on the wall either. Here's where we're at. Mm. We've reviewed it again in two two months or three months, and we reviewed it again in another two th two or three months. There shouldn't be any point in that journey over those that period of time where 
all of a sudden you've been hit by a surprise and mm. saying actually you're closer to release than you are to mm. retain and i think that's probably the bit that i'm going after it's like well how consistent are you how yeah. transparent are you and how well justified yeah. are you in providing mm. that that, mm. that rationale yeah i i agree that 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 piece there um on essentially what you're saying is effective communication and being honest with people and that probably comes out in idps and things like that where you can sit down and Essentially, it's like a parent's evening, isn't it? But these are the things that little Johnny's done really, really well. Mm. Here's some areas of development over here. Um, but yeah, that, that real open dialogue where possible, I think is important. Yeah. Right, guys. Well, there's another conversation with Pete and Yas, special guest Mark Rivers today. And we're looking at retain and release. And we will be back next week. Make sure you like, share and subscribe on YouTube, even though Mark doesn't like it. <laughs> YouTube. <right? laughs> You're going to um, look it up when he goes home. <laughs> but no, thank you again, guys, for tuning in. And we'll be back next week.